it seems like a good time to start. So welcome to everyone here on uh, this Monday, um, April 13th, and uh, quite an extraordinary time that we are all in. Uh, when we first started to look at having this conversation with Katie Carr, um, it was a different world. And um, what a short and extraordinary time it's been since then. So uh, where you have found yourself, you have uh, landed yourself, is at a deep adaptation forum, particularly the Holistic Approaches and Guidance Group, producing a, um, another in a series of interviews with thought leaders in the area of deep adaptation, and particularly in, in terms of facilitation in deep adaptation. Um, you may have seen earlier interviews with representatives of um, the work that reconnects. Uh, we've had a couple of uh, designers and uh, senior trainers for the work that reconnects. And, and now we're thrilled to have Katie Carr here, who is the person who has really held the, the mantle of deep adaptation in terms of the facilitation that might be used in workshops about deep adaptation and also facilitation in terms of the positive deep adaptation Facebook group and uh, influencing, uh, of course, the deep adaptation forum itself. And then uh, Katie, you are a, a part of the core team that's really uh, held the, the container, formed and held the container as, as it has uh, grown from its infancy just last year. And so uh, it's, it's really exciting for me personally that you're here having been to uh, your first full length um, workshop in Greece last year. And I'm so sorry that this uh, evidently is not gonna be happening this year, the version of that. Um, and I'm, I'm so interested in hearing your, your own personal experience of being in something at such an extraordinary scale and really at the perfect time uh, of great need for this kind of work. And, um, and also to hear what you're hear about what you're seeing with the others that you're working with that um, what what is the trajectory like for facilitation in deep adaptation how do you see it changing and particularly in just in these past couple of months so uh, again I'm just um, thrilled that you're here thank you so much for taking this time and thank you all for joining us for this conversation. And please remember that this is a Q&A. We will go over a few starting questions, but uh, I don't think Katie or I have a huge investment in these questions that we have to kind of spark the conversation. Please uh, start to contribute your questions to the chat. And uh, when it's the right time, we will switch over to that as their source of questions and off we go. So um, Katie Carr, thank you so much and uh, welcome here. And is there anything you'd like to share to bring yourself more present to this space? Thanks, Dean, yeah. Um, yeah, there's, there's lots going on at the moment. Part of, uh, part of your introduction then was, it was about the week that we spent together last year in Greece uh, and that's put a smile on my face and then also the huge complexity as, as you named right at the start of the global situation the circumstances in which we find ourselves all connected right now and I guess that might be where I I want to start and it's not really talking about facilitation it's just for me arriving um, 
Yeah, and it's it's been around. Uh, it's it's uh, two things have been really confronting for me recently. Um, yeah, in, in the last couple of months, one of them has been around the fact that uh, there has always been um, at the heart of our approaches to deep adaptation and, and in the groups we work with locally and and online there's always been this uh, this grounding of connection this grounding of togetherness and personally that's that's the place that I've I've gone to that's that's part of my practice and what's really been confronting is witnessing how that is being challenged by the fact that um, people now perceive the threat as being to coming from other people um, and that's that's been really really difficult and I, I've, I've been really really grateful for the work that I've been involved in and my own personal practices over the last few years of cultivating that feeling of connectedness and it not being contingent of, on outside uh, circumstances um, so that's that's there with me at the moment and also uh, yeah checking in with this with this screen of faces some of ho whom I feel really really closely connected with and, and some faces that I haven't seen before and I've just have um, yeah really really this this strong acute awareness of the fact that everybody is being affected in a whole whole lots and lots of different ways and that's um yeah that's with me so i just wanted to say before i uh before we go into this is i, I guess it's just reiterating thank you everybody for uh, for showing up and thanks dean for the invitation mm -hmm. well i I know you know the questions that we came up with quite a while ago that we might sort of start this with. And, and first, I'd, I'd be curious if there are any of them that just seem like a good place that you'd like to start. And my question to you, if, if, if it were mine to ask, um, it would be speaking from your point of view, what's it been like to uh, be involved with this this level of creativity, this level of creation in the face of what I often call the, the most important conversation in human history, and then to watch it grow and be involved with that scale of creation, and then to hit this kind of... Um, amplifier and accelerator that we're we're all talking about these days um, I'm curious about that progression for you so I'm wondering if that would be a good place to to start yeah thank you um, yeah so I I've been involved with this conversation uh, that's now called deep adaptation for uh, for several years before the publication of the paper um, that precipitated the people here becoming involved and the over 10,000 people who were involved in the Facebook group and um, many more people who we, we don't know, we're not connected with. So I, I've been involved in this conversation for several years, as I know you have been and no doubt lots of people in this virtual room have. Um, I guess part of part of the story for me is um, just a little over two years ago when I left my previous role, which was directing a development education charity. And there were two main reasons. So I'd been working with um, with schools in our area in northwest England, and also with um, partner NGOs across Europe. But two main reasons why I left, decided to leave that role and the sector. Um, and one of them was that this 
knowing that it was an impossible task, working with teachers to find ways of um, bringing in what, what I thought was the kind of education that's needed in these times um, into what is effectively the institutional cultural violence within education systems. Um, children are tested and surveilled and they're taught to conform, which is the opposite of the kind of learning which, which is required. Um, and also then personally getting to the point where I could no longer sustain the emotional effort that was required to believe in that story, believe in that story, that theory of change, or at least work as if I believed in it. Um, and I know that that's that same that same story with or certain elements of it is similar for lots and lots of, of people who are now really active in deep adaptation in various parts of the network and in their communities. And um, Jem had asked me, uh, I can't remember how long ago, to work with him on on co-designing the uh, the first deep adaptation retreat, and then about a year ago. He asked me to uh, to join the team officially as a senior facilitator, which is funny because I'm the only one in the team. Um, and so since the um, yeah, and I I'd collaborated with Jem and with others over what some people call post sustainability, or we're, we're calling it that before this phrase deep adaptation became the, the kind of umbrella phrase. Um, and so what's the, you asked what that process, what the process has been like. So um, when he published his paper in July 2018, he wasn't setting out, um, I, I wasn't part of, well, there wasn't a team then, he wasn't setting out to create a network or a social movement. Um, as you'll know, if you've read it, it, it was kind of a goodbye to his the, the sector, the industry, the discourse around um, corporate so social responsibility and uh, sustainability. And, um, but there was something in that paper, which, um, it, you know, he's not the only person who's ever said it, but uh, for an academic paper to be read and downloaded that many times and to have that kind of impact is really unusual. And there were other kind of um, like resonances, other things in the air, if that's the kind of thing that you believe in. So, you know, Extinction Rebellion emerged quite soon after that and Friday's, uh, Friday for Futures movement. So in a really, really short period of time, talking out loud about collapse um, and it's you know it's contestable what we might understand by that and I might talk about that later but talking about out loud about collapse and our emotional responses in particular has become a thing um, so from a personal perspective what that process has been like has been massively rewarding uh, all of a sudden finding myself in um, professional communities of practice where people are speaking their truth, where um, our emotional responses, including fear, anger, uh, paralyzing guilt, all of those things are, are welcome in the room. And that has been a huge relief for me. And, uh, and, and also, and this is a, a a comment that I've heard uh, echoed by lots and lots of people who've been involved in deep adaptation is around the quality of the connections, the relationships and the conversations has an aliveness to it, which I know I had been craving all of my life. Um, so that's the, that's the personal bit. Uh, it sounds great, doesn't it? It's also been very, very challenging. Um, so the, the, a, li a little bit of the, the timeline as well. So 
the Facebook group, first of all, wasn't, um, you know, it was set up in response to Jem receiving hundreds of unsolicited emails from people who'd read his paper um, along the lines of, you're the first person I've heard speaking out loud about these things in public and I've been struggling on my own and I'm going mad and please, please help, what should I do? And of course, you know, there aren't any answers. And even if they were, he, he wouldn't have been able to provide them. Um, so the Facebook group was actually suggested by one of these people who got in touch with him. Um, and that has grown massively. And so my colleague Zori has been working with the, the moderators, learning really, really quickly how to hold space, which is safe enough for uh, for for conflict, safe enough for falling out, safe enough for vulnerability, um, uh, yeah, and and also is as inclusive as possible. Um, similarly, with the advocates group, and I know you're you're one of the international group of advocates, Dean, aren't you? So that was established in response to the fact that lots of organizations and groups were requesting someone to come and, and speak about this topic. Um, the affiliated groups, we've got about 20 around the world now who um, are most of them locally based deep adaptation groups. There are some which are, there's a deep adaptation parenting group which is thematically based and there's a practical deep adaptation. But local groups, um, emerging who were asking for support so this is kind of how the different um, the landscape of the forum has has emerged and it's been uh, nourishing enlivening and deeply challenging thank you I, you just caught me mid writing a note um, It's just been an extraordinary thing to peripherally be a part of in the Deep Adaptation Forum in the Holistic Approaches and Guidance Group. Uh, there have been some, some elements that seem like they parallel and bolster the, the movement so beautifully, like the, there's uh, now a, a whole indexed offering of uh, various folks who offer counseling or facilitation <clears throat> um, or coaching of some kind uh, that has, has come out as a, a sub project from the Deep Adaptation Forum. I'm, I'm curious also, you mentioned a little bit about the, the uh, form of facilitation, like what, what's invited in the facilitation work of, of deep adaptation. And I know uh, Jem has uh, made a point of, of having some remarkable conversations with people, again, thought leaders from various uh, fields that somehow resonate with or parallel deep adaptation. I'm curious if you could tell us a little bit about the, the elements that you've drawn on for both the workshop design and delivery, and then also for the facilitation itself, um, methodologies that you found very useful, and uh, and particularly, are there any of those um, those thought leaders that I just mentioned that are in have influenced you that that you bring their influences uh, in as well, not necessarily to the you know, the actual facilitation form or method, but that influence you nonetheless. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so starting, first of all, by acknowledging that it's not a brand new thing. There are so many people and so many practices and approaches already where... Um, <laughs> I often hear, have heard people say, and maybe you have too in the uh, holistic approaches and guidance group, um, people say, now I know why I've been doing this work. You know, this 
this is the time for this work. So there, there are there are lots and lots. And the very first um, kind of facilitated process or space that I took part in was in uh, just outside Totnes in the south of England, um, and it was it was. The, it was a deep adaptation, deep dive. It was a four-day process. It was so courageous, so imaginative. Um, it was the back end of 2018. And it was held by um, Naresh, who you know, from the Transition Towns movement, uh, and his partner, Sophie Banks. Uh, Tony Spencer, who I think is part of the Holistic Approaches and Guidance Group and Ruth Ben Tobin um, and yeah some really really beautifully creatively held um, I, I guess personally for me one of the biggest areas of influence is not about an individual or, or a practice but it's from the the root in has been critical pedagogy so um, critical consciousness and discourse studies and I don't want to over theorize but it is a really really important area that's been foundational for the development of some of, of our principles and practices um, so a fundamental part of that approach is saying that uh, in anything that we do including um, not just physical actions and the way we engage in the world but our speech act and also our thought acts, the way we make sense. Um, it, it's uh, everything that we do uh, in deep adaptation is based on the belief that the destruction of the biosphere has not been an accident, that in actual fact it's an inevitable conclusion of the ways that, that human thought and ways of relating and ways of organising our stories of what it means to be human. Um, how they have progressed. So we believe that what we can do in gatherings, in relating with each other, is to help each other become aware of those patterns of thought, the patterns of thought that enable domination of one group over another or of humans over non-humans. Um, and this in... Uh, in sociology and in critical education, this is it's raising awareness of, of shining a light on those patterns of thought. It's called critical consciousness, and most people here may have heard of Paolo Freire, um, who is probably most famous uh, for, for talking about critical pedagogy. Um, so it could be as simple as inviting people to understand the, the ways in which even the use the words that we use define and therefore limit possibilities for action um, so if we want to create change we need to go right down to that fundamental level of how we um, how we understand ourselves and how we understand the world or society or our relationship um, so some of the words uh, one of my favourite areas to sort of play around with with critical pedagogy is this area called econophonics. Um, so simply looking at the ways in which words associated with the economy and finance and transactionality um, have embedded in our day-to-day -day speech and how these metaphors shift and influence how we think. Um, so some examples of that might be uh, in school homework or uh, we talk about is it time well spent or we might say I'm really invested in this relationship and these these metaphors of transactionality and getting value out of the way that we engage are so deeply embedded in the way that we relate that they pretty much become invisible. Uh, so critical pedagogy is about creating spaces that um, make it possible for us to to look at these things. Um, and we might ask questions. Uh, critical ped pedagogy is also about power. So it's about enabling people to look at a situation and say, 
what is actually happening here? Is there a different way for me to understand what's happening here? Um, how, uh, how can I see how power is playing out? And what about the ways in which I'm unconsciously colluding in recreating those power dynamics? Um, so another example of, of that, the, the fact that the way we think and the way we speak influences how we've got to where we are and we need to deconstruct that before we can be together differently. Um, the fact that we talk about humans and nature or the environment, which is something which surrounds us. Um, so that's really been, um, that's very, very influential on the thinking of uh, facilitation, the, the evolution of facilitation and deep adaptation. And then of course it, it, you can see from that basis um, how we then draw on practices which invite the whole person into a space. So one of the, one of the very, very first things that I was uh, uh, tasked with doing in, uh, in the deep adaptation team was just hosting gatherings, hosting gatherings of volunteers, hosting gatherings of advisors, um, to hold a space which makes sure that anything is welcome, including the emotional, including non-action. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I think that for me, that's the most important part. And from that has arisen um, uh, bringing in elements of, of um, deep ecology and it connects really closely with Joanna Macy's work and any kinds of approaches that foreground the non-cognitive so um, holistic approaches which bring in feeling and sensing and being or spirit um, somatic work and uh, work around the the liminal spaces because the how important it is if we are uh, Charles Eisenstein talks about the um, the space between stories you know and if we're relinquishing or deconstructing or letting go of or having dragged away from us the old stories there is this process there, there is this space of the liminal um, and we don't have a lot of practice in our Western modern society. We don't have a lot of practice in being with uncertainty and nebulousness. Um, so, yeah, all of those things are in the mix. Yeah. Thank you. Very, very clear. And, um, yeah, it's, it's so important for me to understand um what what's been um developing and growing and evolving uh particularly over in the positive deep adaptation facebook group and the facilitators that you've been um um bringing forth in into a, a team of sorts um because i i'm just not there nearly as much as i'm over in the in the forum so it's so um, rich to hear you describe what elements you're bringing to that uh, that development, that evolution of a body of facilitators there in particular. Um, what do you think? Is it is it time to uh, see if we can come up with some questions from folks in the uh, in the viewership yeah. here? I was wondering, one of the things that might be useful um, yeah. before we do is just to, because like you, there'll be a lot of people here who might have engagement with one or another part of the landscape. And maybe I could talk a little bit about what's actually happening uh, around facilitation. And that might, might help to kind of hook some future questions on. Thank you. Yes. Would that be okay? Of course. Yeah, thank you. So, um, yeah, the basic stuff when I first started, as I said, was just about bringing in um, and, and embedding a, across the 
uh, ecosystem, if you like, um, practices of being together um, as we collaborated. So even internally, decision-making practices, which were based on these principles of uh, spotting where insidious power stories might be in the room um, and, and hosting, uh, hosting meetings with volunteers and things like that. And that's, that, that's kind of, um, yeah, I'm, I'm moving away from that a little bit now. So the other kinds of things that have happened early on with, um, with my colleague, Dori, who, uh, who is also um, outside of the work here, she's a facilitator as well. So we, we developed um, the deep adaptation gatherings principles, which tried to make a, a kind of entry level um, kind of set of principles for people who were just feeling moved and moving into hosting conversations in their communities and I think that this might respond a little bit to Sasha's question in the chat box which is as new teams come together to help with the work of DA and who may not have this background in critical consciousness how might you suggest we find ways of bringing this way of being in um, so yeah this document of um, it's really really it's it's a uh, I'm going to try and copy the link into the chat box. I'm not very good at multitasking. I'll do it. Don't worry. Oh, thank you, Nanad. We can't get Katie's volume up, but I can put my mic near in my face. Um, so this was uh, so intended as an entry level to do exactly what you asked about, Sasha. Um, for people, I mean, even people who don't self-identify as, as community hosts or facilitators or conveners, um, and the intention is is really kind of um, it's a little bit like the shift that we're seeing in the climate psychology alliance from psychology being the um, strict uh, strictly owned by uh, by psychologists and the profession, um, whereas actually we all need to become more confident in hosting conversations in in enabling collaboration or togetherness so that was the thinking behind this this document um, yeah and, and also this notion of don't let don't let great be the enemy of good you know lots of people feel very nervous about hosting conversations and particularly so in this really really um, intense and difficult topic so that's what the uh, principles were about um, what else have we done as um, as Dean said there is a, a group a, a private closed group of Facebook users all of whom are members of the bigger positive deep adaptation group but it's facilitators from lots of different backgrounds who are um, sharing practice it's, it's kind of acting like a community of practice and we meet regularly at least once a month uh, we share practices with each other we have inquiries into um, into themes and the people there are also volunteering their time and, and have been for a few months in hosting spaces both inside the deep adaptation network but also outside um, so they might be doing um, deep adaptation, what we call deep adaptation practices like listening spaces um, or death cafes. In fact, that started more recently, but they don't necessarily call it that. Um, but yeah, an amazing group of people, many of whom are, some of whom are here today. Thank you all so much. Um, so that's something which is which is growing as well. Um, I mentioned death cafes. They've just started with uh, an amazing woman called Sue Brain, who came on another one of our retreats last year. And she's uh, her professional work area is in uh, death and bereavement and uh, rites and rituals around that. 
so we've been exploring what's what's different about hosting death cafes online and what's different about hosting death cafes within the context of, of deep adaptation and they're just they're beautiful spaces so it's really um it's a relaxed atmosphere it's a friendly atmosphere um, people are encouraged to bring their cup of tea and the cake or their favorite biscuits and just talk about um, talk about their relationship with death it's not necessarily a space for uh, for grief although it can easily come up um, but it's just addressing this um, addressing this almost uh, pathological aversion which is part of uh, most Western culture uh, people who have been brought up in a Western culture uh, this aversion to death and not only do we need to start talking about it because it's healthy but also our aversion to death has played such such an important part in the um, habitual unsustainability of of the choices we make collectively um, and I'm just thinking whether there's anything else important um, Oh, the, uh, one of the things that we tried last year as well was um, offering some small amount of funding to fund some deep adaptation dialogue days, which took place in six different localities. Uh, I think three in Europe, one in South Africa, one in Canada, and one in the States, I think. And they were full day events, which were hosted using the open space technology approach which was not about going we need to talk about deep adaptation and what needs to happen it was about getting people together to talk about first of all how are you relating with this issue and second of all what are the needs in your community to begin to deeply adapt both uh, you know the, the personal the emotional the inner work and also the practical outer work so they're some of the things that you might actually see happening uh, under facilitation in, in this area. Katie, I'm, I'm wondering as you're laying this out, these various pieces that have been created and so on, I, I'm wondering if you could say a little bit about uh, circling or authentic relating and any of those, uh, that type of methodology that might be used and what distinguishes that? Yeah. Yeah, I'm trying to think where to start to then drill down. So yeah, this um, practice of circling or or authentic relating. It's I don't like the phrase authentic relating because I think the word authentic is questionable and even potentially damaging when we're when we're talking about this particular area. Um, but it's a process which is uh, described as uh, sometimes it's a practice a meditative practice in relationship um, or uh, it's I don't know how to describe it really so it's this isn't something which is brand new either. It's um, similar practices in uh, in Buddhism. Um, in I think they call it insight insight dialogue. Um, there it's called focusing in therapy. Uh, yeah, so it's a, it's a process of it's an approach of being in relationship with another person or group of people that's grounded in deep and detailed awareness of present moment experience. And the reason why this uh, has been so important for deep adaptation or certainly the ways in which we've been hosting spaces and encouraging this approach is the overarching mission of deep adaptation is to embody and enable loving responses to our predicament so that we reduce suffering while saving more of society and the natural world. And this is 
I hope you'll be able to see how this connects to the, the critical consciousness framing that I talked about earlier. So in order to reduce harm, reduce suffering, um, and Gemma sometimes used the phrase, extend the glide and soften the crash. There has to be an understanding of the social and cultural mechanisms that have led to our collective failure to live harmoniously with each other and with the wider, wider system of life on earth that we are a part of. Um, and to understand the ways that those, those mechanisms, they're not out there, they, they're in here. You know, it's so easy to be having the conversation where we can blame evil people who did this or those people who never stopped that. Um, but we need to, um, and I think this is one of one of the reasons why, you know, there has been 40 years more of very, very clear environmental activism and messaging. And it has been almost impossible for people to face that head on because it means we have to face head on how the ugly parts of humanity are also in each of us. Um, so in order to, uh, in order for there to be any kind of change, and I'm not talking about the change which says, if we just do everything right, if we work harder and if we work, just find the right way, then we can turn all of this around. I'm talking about the change which means um, maybe we can take a much more dignified and slower and respectful and loving way of supporting each other through an inevitable decline of finding ways of not having oh, this has been the most one of the most confronting parts for me as well about the last couple of months is is seeing played out on on Facebook in newspapers the what happens when we panic collectively those ugly parts of us are the parts that come up so quickly um, and my my wish and the reason why I'm doing this work is that some of us can support each other in regulating those parts of ourselves in in filling the space with more love forgiveness acceptance so that the so that the angry panicky reactive parts aren't the ones which uh, which define what the story of this era is um, and in order to do that in order to really really accept in order to forgive um, in order to reconnect and uh, in order for reconciliation to be possible we need to be able to uh, face up to those parts in ourselves face up to the uh, the sexist one the bigot the racist one the one who wants to dominate the one who is so scared of being um, uh, uh, dominated that has to fight first and the reason why um, deep relating or circling or the this particular approach has been so important is that it um, those those patterns of reaction of defensiveness of um, recreating the story of who I think I should be in the world and therefore recreating uh, the normative uh, function that our that our culture gives that tells me how I should be they happen so quickly they're so hidden you know I, I really the phrase the old Chinese ancient Chinese traditional saying that says if you want to know if you want a description of water don't ask a fish our culture is so hidden to us that it takes so much 
slowing down and discipline and help from others to be able to start discerning it. Um, and the deep relating practices is a really, really simple one, um, which encourages us to be with each other while we are noticing the ways that all of these stories are, are, are playing out. And it seems really, really simple. And, you know, when we're craving after big systemic change, it seems like sitting in a circle with other people talking about, you know, your, your inner child or your, whatever might come up um, seems really, you know, it's, it's, not, it's not big enough. It's not dramatic enough. But actually the source of those big stories can be followed all the way down to what's happening in here. And collectively, we need to grow up. We need to grow up and we need to make space for those parts of ourselves uh, which which want to be heard, the, the angry teenagers or the scared children. We can't keep pushing those those parts away because they will manifest somewhere else. That was a bit of a rambling answer, but it's really difficult to talk about what that practice is without without there being lots and lots of around the houses. You know, I, I was just appreciating and, and going to mention how much I appreciate you taking us on that journey, <clears throat> excuse me, to, un, to understand some of the elements, these, these conceptual elements and, and methodological elements in, in how you put them together into the facilitation that's come, come to be known as deep adaptation. And I, uh, what I'd like to offer is that this might be a good opportunity to, to look at a couple of the questions that are on the chat, particularly for folks who they're, they're asking about, so how do I include, I think I'm getting, I, I know I'm appreciating this work and it's useful for me, but how do I bring in people who are barely on the periphery of this conversation? They clearly, uh, this, uh, if I can just make up some stuff about what I'm seeing a couple of the questions, these are people that are dear to me. How do I include them in the conversation? It's so, um, it seems like such a huge stretch to include them and to somehow minimize the reactivity that you were just talking about, the, the polarization that can just set in in a moment. Um, can you speak to how it shows up in real time and real conversations and perhaps with those who are a bit reluctant or, or at least don't know what it is and a bit fearful about what is this conversation? Yeah. This is, um, I, I can, and what I can do is go straight to the most difficult, the examples of the most difficult ones of types of those conversations that I've had. Um, and they are invariably with my nearest and dearest. And I, I know I haven't done it very well. So I, I I can I can answer by saying yeah this is how I've tried it and these this is what I've learned and this is what I've learned from through speaking with other people but it's with a caveat that there isn't any you know my opinion on this is just as valid as yours as Sasha's as as Chris's there's no expert um, on on this topic so um, yeah, so it was easier actually for me to learn to have these conversations, I think, in a professional context. And I'm thinking back to my previous role, and I think it might have been because there's a certain amount there's a certain part of myself that I didn't take into those conversations. You know, I, I was, I left the vulnerable part behind or just said shush now to, for a minute. So in a professional context, in some regards, it was easier for me to say to 
you know, colleagues that I, I uh, collaborated with, what if? You know, we're doing this work based on this assumption and this assumption and this assumption. But in, in the professional context, what if we are doing a disservice to the people that we're working with? Whereas the people that I have, that I, I am going back some years, the people who I longed to have the conversation with were the people that I loved most. And, uh, and you know, not not everybody's on the same page you know I, it, I I recognize that in part longing to have that conversation with my nearest and dearest yeah at least in part came from a place of wanting to rescue them wanting to protect them um, and knowing that I, actually I can't I can't force having a conversation with with my brother, for example, about, uh, you know, have you thought about what you're going to do when there isn't very much food left in your town? Um, so, yeah, I guess my, my way of being has been to be unapologetic about my worldview and um, invite people into conversations gently but also be really um really really respectful mm -hmm. you know people know where where i am people know they can speak to me about this issue as and when they might they might want to but it's a waste of my time and energy and it's, it feels somewhat a little bit violent trying to force the conversation on people for whom you know the the, the the readiness just isn't there um yeah yeah thank you for that i i want to remind all the folks who have joined us on the call that this is a a q and a session and there are a number of great comments and questions that have been added to this uh, conversation. And uh, please dig deep. And this, this is a wonderful opportunity, not just to, you know, uh, offer these questions and explorations to Katie, um, but also as you're already doing, to bring your perspective to the chat and to, and to share with one another. This is uh, Katie, you said it beautifully, you know, that we don't have the answers. This is not what Katie will come up with in the, in the A part of the Q&A. And so really let's each of us, <clears throat> excuse me, let's each of us bring forth the most potent questions that we can bring to each other here in this environment and then respond to one another and, and perhaps spark Katie uh, to to just bring forth her experience as she just was. Um, and Katie, I don't, <clears throat> I don't know if you're uh, able to read any of the, the questions as they've been posted. And I'm wondering if you would just take a look and see if anything sparks you. Mm. If not, I have some sparks over here. Yeah, absolutely. I wanted to respond to a, a message that Pam shared. Um, about the fact that your brother Pam has started to get it as a result of coronavirus. Yeah, absolutely. It's, um, I, I found the same thing with lots and lots of people I know. And um, it's that, you know, prior to something being actually on your doorstep and actually threatening your own life or the life that you have become accustomed to feeling entitled to, it can be really difficult to, um, to imagine. And uh, yeah, I just wanted to say thanks for sharing that, Pam. Um, and there's another, the final, last question here from Nicole. How do we bring this conversation to the table with 18 to 25 year olds, those embarking on life, university, or have just come out right at the beginning of creating life? And the paradigm they know and is breaking. Um, yeah, I, I think um, so. 
So I've worked in my previous pre deep adaptation team work. It was all with uh, with young people and with teachers and, and youth workers in schools. And um, I definitely there, there are other experts to um, to have a look at. That there's um, a woman called Caroline Hickman who is a member of the Climate Psychology Alliance who is doing some brilliant work with young people and conversations with young people. Um, and I'm just connecting back with the last um, few years ago, I did a, I delivered an undergraduate module on sustainability for third year undergraduates on a, uh, they were doing an, a, an outdoor learning and outdoor management course. And I brought this issue, I, I couldn't, um, but in the context of what if, and of course, a few years ago is, is different now. Um, I think the main, the main thing with young people is they know if you are bullshitting, they know straight away. So if you are showing up pretending to be expert for one thing, or, or if you're showing up and somehow... Uh, yeah, doing what I described before in this professional context, if you're kind of hiding your fear because of this idea that you're responsible for these young people's emotional well-being, they know straight away. And they, that's the opposite of creating a safe space. Um, and the, just one other bit of advice is, um, even in the wording of your question, how do we bring this conversation to the table? I think you'll probably find you're not the first person to be bringing it. I, I think, you know, going into that space with, with absolutely open-minded and open-hearted curiosity and using questioning and listening skills to find out where they're <coughs> at um, and meeting where they're at because there, there aren't any, yeah, there aren't any answers. There aren't any ways that you can hear young people's dilemmas and, and offer a solution or a, or a dilemma, but you can support their agency. You can support their, uh, you can get a, you can validate the, the feelings that they may be having and expressing just through witnessing. Yeah. Are there any other questions there that are jumping out at you, Dean? Yes. <laughs> I'm I'm curious uh just on a on a very personal level because I I so appreciated the the availability of both you and Jem in your work in the uh, initial course last year in Greece. And I'm curious if you could speak for yourself about what, um, what is challenging for you to grapple with in these times and in this work? Um, what really strain, <clears throat> strains your capacity? And, uh, Perhaps on the back side of that question, you could speak about any <clears throat> excuse me any self regulation practices that you carry that you found helpful yeah it's the answer to the question is really, really different now than it would have been two months ago mm -hmm. um yeah, what are some aspects that are challenging for me to grapple with or accept? I do find working on this so intensively all of the time, and I know that it's it's different for many of the people that we we connect with in the network because there's there's lots of people who 
are doing their day jobs and then you know nursing this process or knowledge or something as, as a smaller part of their lives but that's not that's not the case for me so you know I, I do have to regularly check in with myself to check in with this balance of staying um staying open to it in a way that's healthy that we, last year we were at the buddha fields festival the green earth awakening festival uh sharing some stuff on deep adaptation and one of the groups there had rewritten the question for uh, i think it might have been uh guess it would have been reconciliation yeah it would so rather than the um, with what or with whom do I need to make peace uh, the, the question they'd rewritten was um, how do I stay open to this and uh, so that's that's a real ongoing challenge for me um, but also knowing that this um, opening and closing opening and closing is normal you know that's the the pattern of our breath it's the pattern of of uh, birth and life and death it's you know this constant movement is really really yeah i don't need to stay in this raw fully open place all of the time but i do need to make sure that I'm not, um, you know, skirting it or avoiding it. it. It's important if I'm working with people on this issue that I am present and aware of which part of the opening and closing I'm at at any given time. Um, yeah, and it's hard. It, it is hard. It's... Um, there is, yeah, just going back to the thing, as I said earlier, the thing that's been most confronting for me about, about the uh, people's responses to coronavirus is staying open to the facing full on the, the tendency we have towards blame and othering and, you know, this... This, the violence was it, which is at, right there in all of our individual personalities and our collective patterning. Um, to to see that, to witness it on an ongoing basis, is is hard. Um, so my self regulation practices, I feel like in the last few weeks, all I've been doing is self regulation <laughs> regulation practices. Um, and I have, so I struggle a little bit with the word, with the phrase self-regulation, um, because it's, it has this managing one's emotions or controlling behaviors or emotions that are problematic or, um, so I think of it more as, uh, for me, what self-regulation means, means the art of being whole. It means welcoming anything that's there at any time and but but creating an inner space which is expanded enough to contain it all um, so i I think about the the practices that I do have as the 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 densest parts of me the the anger the defensiveness the uh the, the fear the reactivity aren't ever going to go away that's what i'm made of it's what we're all made of so my practices are about expanding my sense of self so they're much bigger than that so i am big enough to contain anything that comes up and um so the practices that I have are all about uh, uh, union or 
integration or you know bringing all of those different parts together welcoming them all together um, and also about awareness so I'm really grateful to a couple of friends of mine who I do this deep relating on a regular basis just as a kind of checking in how am I what's happening inside um, I meditate regularly uh, I have practices around the um, acknowledging and integrating the four elements into my life. So I like to go and stick my feet in the earth. Uh, I like to go and actively breathe and appreciate the air. Uh, I have, you know, water cleansing rituals. And um, I also am, uh, I it's quite a, this is quite a niche thing that not many people have heard of but I am involved in um, spiritual community around dances of universal peace which is around dance and, uh, and movement and chanting um, around different sacred phrases from every every different wisdom tradition in the world uh, so yeah there's there's lots going on and more and more recently I've uh, yeah I've just been so grateful for that and realized actually that all I have all we have is this is this kind of practice all the rest of it the doing the planning the, the building the preparing all of the outside stuff can emerge so much more organically or not you know or we can let it go um, but all we have at the moment is is this being well enough in order to support people around us. Yeah. Yeah. Beautifully put. You, you shifted gears to the next question or, or um, request that I had for you, for you to comment on. And that is to, you know, co-regulation, which seems like that, you know, I'm, I agree that self-regulation and co-regulation, they're, they're just awkward phrases that are sort of baggage ridden um but nonetheless that it, it seems like the facilitation work of deep adaptation is built into it co-regulation is built into it self-regulation that's really seems like those are the some of the threads that are woven through every gathering every time we have a, a chance to presence ourselves or become more aware in a, in a given circle or given situation. And um, again, I, I, I'm noticing uh, in, in the, the last comment in particular, uh, Pam shares about being burnt out after having been involved with this type of work for quite some time. Um, I'm, I'm curious if there's anything that you've you've uh, run into yourself or crafted for yourself that really addresses that um, really it's just it's just uh, I'm asking for more elaboration if there is any more for you uh, elaboration on what you've already started telling us about your self-regulation practices um, is there anything that you're noticing as you're training other people to become facilitators in this work, anything from your years of experience in this kind of work with teachers on the front line in some of the most difficult work that there is in the first place, you know, um, what, how can you bridge for us into the very real world of, of, uh, of burnout, of, of losing, our connection with our own spirit, with what motivates us, even in these excruciating times. Yeah, thanks. I'm really, really glad that you um, picked up Pam, Pam's message then, because uh, I had wanted to. And it, it's really, it's so, so important. And, and it's really, really personal as well. So um, I feel you. Pam, when you say it really is burnout. About four years ago, 
I got a thing that really was burnout and it wouldn't have mattered how many times somebody had described it to me I could never have understood how awful it was um, so I have learnt um, I learned so much from it. I wouldn't change a thing, even though it, it was just the most hideous and terrifying thing I've ever experienced. Um, but I learned the hard way, you know, and I don't think I would have ever learned to uh, let go so much, so many of my stories of self that I didn't realize I had. Um, I, I don't think I could have got there through therapy um, ever. Um, but just the universe had been sending, you know, little whispers of this, this story you're telling yourself about how the world will be changed and how you're going to be contributing to it. I'm not so convinced, doesn't seem sustainable, don't know. But there was this part of me who's learnt um, I'm a good person and I'm a capable person and you know, I need to support people and bring these gifts or talents or whatever it was. Um, that part of me just kept working and working because when you're, um, I guess this will resonate with a lot of people here, when you are working within the context of uh, climate catastrophe, there is nobody there at the end of the day saying, you've done enough now that's fine, just go home, switch off, you don't need to worry about it anymore. It's absolutely all-encompassing. Um, so my, the biggest things that I have learned about this topic are that um, pausing, taking it easy, playing, laughing, they are actually very, very powerful political acts. You know, I, I, um, when I finally did give myself time off instead of trying to think I can heal this and I can do work, um, I sat on my ass in my dressing gown for about two months and knew that I needed it and knew also that it was a powerful political choice it's political with a small p it's, it's about saying no the, these stories of hard work don't don't define me um so this is part one of the things i said earlier about don't let great be the enemy of good uh none of us is perfect none of us is a is a hero trying to be does more harm than good um so yeah I think there's one other thing. There was a there was a piece of research that I was um, that I was involved in a few years ago that was looking exactly this. It was looking at how uh, it was in the in the education uh, uh, sustainability education sector context, uh, but looking internationally and rather than what works and what do we do and how do we have impact and blah, blah, blah. This looked on the other side about how, how people construed the reality of the work that they were doing and how it was wound up with, with um, uh, their identity, stories of self and, uh, and life experiences. And almost without exception, the people who gravitated towards activisty, social justice, environmental justice work were the ones who had experienced, um, it was a combination of two things. It was the experience, uh, like, I don't know, early trauma or, or particular, you know, context of injustice in their own life, coupled with the ability, um, life experiences that had meant they had seen different parts of the world and not only been immersed in one culture and those two things together more or less equal burnout <laughs> because you have this worldview that shows you how important 
justice is or, or whatever it is, whatever the issue is that you're working on. And also you can see how many people are suffering because of it. Um, so uh, self-care has to become before people care and before planet care. Yeah, that's beautiful. I cried every day for four months, two years ago, and gave myself the time to emerge as a different person after total burnout. There is light at the end of the tunnel. Yes, thank you so much, Emma. That, that sums up my experience really beautifully. Um, I just one, <clears throat> one more time want to invite everyone uh, who's participating in this to bring your questions for that you live out of, the questions that you'd like to offer to Katie, the questions that you'd like to offer to all of us. And um, we have about 15 minutes left. And my, uh, my lingering question for you, Katie, is do you allow yourself to uh, dream that I, you know, there's this well used phrase for those of us who've been in the collapse aware community for quite some time. Uh, Charles Eisenstein's famous, uh, more beautiful world we all, our hearts know is possible. Um, <clears throat> I'm curious if you let yourself, let your heart uh, express the more beautiful world it knows is possible. I'm just reaching for a piece of paper, which uh, speaks to that. And um, the reason why I'm reaching for it is that, excuse me while I just resettle, plug myself back in. Do I dream for the more beautiful world that my heart knows is possible? No. No, I don't. I... Uh, hmm. So this is leaning into something if this feels vulnerable to lean into now. So I just want to uh, be with it and not rush into it. No, I don't dream of a world, that, a more beautiful world that my heart knows is possible. And I remember reading that book the first time and I remember my response to the first few paragraphs, which is where Charles describes a, a past world he has nostalgia for a past world where the, the one part of it that I can remember was was talking about drinking a can of cola without feeling guilty you know when it's just a different world when we didn't know about this and we didn't know about that and you know every aspect of being wasn't tied up with the complexity of the of the the horror which is out there so when I think of that I um yes I have a nostalgia but it isn't I would never choose to not be able to face into the difficulty um I'm also a little bit I wonder whether ending with this question Dean is part of that the the human um we want to finish on a high note that we we need there to be a happy ending we need there to be some kind of neat resolution um, and the thing that I um, yeah one of my self-regulation practices has been writing um, and I'm going to finish by reading a piece of my writing if that's okay uh, of course and it's called the death of dreams I've grieved my body I've grieved my child I've grieved safety, security, longevity, legacy. I've grieved the white rhino, the songbirds that once visited my garden, the moths and insects of my childhood, and I've even grieved soil microbes. I've grieved the crumbling of generations worth of community, 
the sense that there is something noble and ethical underpinning our collective efforts at self-organizing. Human rights, protecting the most vulnerable, separation of state and judiciary, lest we forget. All of that, no doubt deeply held and well-intentioned, melts away and reveals itself as the first, uh, in the first moments of panic. It's still there, this sadness in my body, an ache. Some days it's faint, the constant background of my being, the canvas upon which my daily joys, frustrations, silences, laughter are all painted. At other times, it's all I can feel. Grief so painful that it burns my skin. There's a stabbing in that most vulnerable part of me, beneath and between my ribs. So painful, I'm paralyzed, pleading for respite. And in those moments, I'm ashamed to say I'd give anything to be relieved of this excruciating pain. But there's a darker place, the grief that I have not yet been able to get close to, or even glance towards, is the death of dreams. So I don't dream very much about the future, but I do regularly and every day encounter the more beautiful world it's this it's not a, it's not a future thing for me it's in the relationships it's in the uh, the presence the connections the imagination and the ability to stand side by side and face into that the rawness of that pain together Yeah. Well, beautiful. Thank you. I uh, I couldn't imagine uh, a more poignant and um, so very personal um, a sharing from you. Thank you. Um, we do have a few minutes left, and somehow I'm not quite sure how I've done it, but I've. I've silenced everyone in this call and, and somehow it's, <laughs> it's ended up that uh, the, the only way that people are communicating is through the, uh, the chat. I'm wondering if you have just a few more minutes in you, Katie, if we could uh, ask a couple of folks uh, who will self-select to ask a brief question and hopefully a brief response so we might have a last couple of interactions so first is is that okay katie no it's fine with me yeah, yeah. okay thank you can i go this is barney barney make sure it's please it's that it's short and uh we'll allow katie a short answer because i i recall your question as it was written and it, it's quite extraordinary hi katie um hello I don't have my video on because uh, I haven't put my makeup on for this morning. Um, the question is, um, um, uh, would deep adaptation involve shifting from uh, a permanent sense of personhood? Uh, I use the word substance ontology, and as a philosophy that says that we're independent from the conditions that produce us, and sh that shift to process ontology where um, in the Buddhist practice is known as dependent arising. And this way there is no entitled constancy of self, rather the self uh, fluxes much like the flowers where they uh, go back into the ground in winter, but they bud out in spring. And this way our resiliency is in lockstep with the conditions that produces this. Short answer, yes. <laughs> the, um, yes, absolutely. One thing that arises in the process of relinquishing stories of self, which I think is, is really a, 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 an important facet an important element of deep adaptation is 
it's not just I am this person, there is a true self and this story of being a really successful and uh, director is one of the sheddable parts. What arises, it, what emerges is a realisation that any part, any facet is just hooked onto this this story of a, I can't remember what, you, what word you use, but sub an ontology of substantive yeah, sub substance yeah substance yeah. ontology where uh, we um, we have outside of a self that is independent of the supports that produces us and yeah. then when the supports go away we still want to cry for that very same self yeah and even the part that wants to cry is is one of these uh, contingents ingredients um I, the, the answer is yes i think what you've just described is um it's not it, it's not the it's not one of the most um easy or normal places for somebody who's grown up in this western mindset of you know i am real this is real i'm surrounded i live in a world of facts it's not it's not a natural, I wouldn't say, place to find yourself in. And yet it, it was a place where I that I found myself in in my burnout phase is, is just suddenly realizing that all these elements of self are just it's like um parts of me that are only mirrors, they're just constituted by the way that I engage with the world around me. And What's, what's inside is more or less empty or neutral. Yeah, I think it's this divorcing of the supports that is the problem, rather than being in connection with the supports. What do you mean by the supports? In other words, if the food uh, dwindles, um, okay. I also dwindle with it. But, but but there's a sense of um, that is just the external shell of who I am that dwindles, mm -hmm. whereas there is a constant um, sense of awareness that um, uh, is not uh, contingent on that that uh, external shell. Mm. So uh, Barney, I'm going I'm going to need to. Um put in a kind of a wedge here or placeholder so, so yep. that you and Katie might pursue this, this, the ending of this conversation offline. I, I'm so struck by the personal sharing that you did before Katie that I'd like to just shift back if I may to uh, thank you so much for reading what you read. And I'd, I'd also, since we have such a short time left, I'd very much like to invite uh, if you're willing, I'm going to name a couple of folks who have left some heartfelt responses to your reading. And I'd like to ask them to unmute themselves and just speak with you for a few moments about their, their thanks and their reaction. Uh, one is um, Emma Mary Malvern. If you're willing, would you unmute yourself and uh, feel free to voice what you've said in the chat. Oh, Katie, gosh, I'm 73. I've been talking this language for years. So few people do. I am so moved. Thank you. Just thank you. Thanks, Emma. I've been banging my head against the brick wall for so many years, and now you guys are taking over. I can retire <laughs> happily. You exist. <laughs> thank you. Mm. I'm a happy bunny. <laughs> Thank you so much. And I'm wondering if Nicole would like to speak a bit. Hello. Hi, Katie. Hi, everyone. Um, I just feel the grief woven into everything. And when I look at or hear a bird song, something that brings me so much joy 
or read poetry. It's shot through with grief. And it's both heart-wrenchingly painful and beautiful. And your writing was such a, a such an acknowledgement of I'm not alone. And as Ma Emma Mary has said, and I'm so glad you can take a rest, Emma, that, um, yeah, your sharing is very profound and so important and not to be frightened of it. We can manage these feelings. They're so life affirming. Mm. Thank you. Thank you, Nicole. So we've come to the end of, ah. <laughs> we've come to the end of this time. And Katie, it's been so precious to have your sharing in this, uh, uh, your participation in the creation of this extraordinary expression uh, called deep adaptation, bringing your expertise, bringing your heart, your spirit, your soul, uh, I want to thank you so much for the work that you've done, uh, the unbelievable quantity and quality of work that you've done to make these things happen and have them grow. And thank you so much for bringing your uh, depth and fullness to this conversation, sharing with us what it's like to be doing what you do, being who you be. Thank you so much. Is there anything you'd like to say to uh, put a bow on it? Uh, no, I, well, yes, Dean, I'd like to thank you, first of all, for the invitation, but also your really, really gentle hosting. I have never read any of my stuff out loud in front of people before, so I must have been feeling quite safe and well held here, so thank you very much. Um, and, and, yeah, it's just, um, What Nicole, echoing what Nicole said, um, yes, of course we can hold it. It's it's what we're, we're born for. Um, and yeah, big thanks to everybody. The fa as I said, the faces on the screen who I know and uh, work with regularly. It's it's just uh, it's lovely to have you here. Thanks so much. Mm -hmm. Thank you all for your participation with us in the Deep Adaptation Forum Holistic Approaches and Guidance Group produced Q&A with Katie Carr. Katie, thank you again. All of us take care, warmest you, blessings. And it's fine time to turn off, turn on your microphone and say farewell. <laughs> Thank you. I'll um, Thank you, share Katie. that writing on the Thank event. Thank you so much, Katie. Thank, yeah. you. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Take Thank care. You. Bye, everybody. Bye.